Hey guys, welcome to part two of our 70 to 180 G2 review. Uh, if you guys caught the video last week, I spoke very briefly on some of the details that I'm gonna be discussing a little bit more in depth in this video. I'll leave that link in the description down below. So if you wanna go and check that out before you watch this one or go ahead and watch this one so you can get a more comprehensive review. So on my list of notes, one thing that I wanted to discuss is the comparison between this lens and the previous version. So obviously this is the version two. It looks a little bit different. It feels a little bit different. The weight is a little bit different. So this does weigh a little bit more than the original version. To be honest, I didn't pull the exact amount of what it weighs versus the other one. Just it's a slightly heavier lens because it has more packed into this lens. However, when I compare this to a 70 to 200 2.8, for example, the difference in weight is significant in that regard. So I still would pick this over a 70 to 200, in my opinion, the extra 20 millimeter I'm not going to miss, but the lightness of it, even with the version two that has a little bit more heft to it is still worth the, if you even want to call it sacrifice of not getting the extra 20 mil. The feel on it is definitely more like the 35 to 150. So it has more of that shiny plastic on it. It feels a little bit thicker. It still has the lock button on the side so it doesn't zoom out as you're walking around. It now has the custom buttons that you can customize just like a lot of Tamron lenses. It has the USB-C on the side. If you wanted to customize the buttons, you can go into Tamron Lens Utility and you can customize those to what makes the most sense for you. Personally, I don't do too much with that. I think on the 35 to 150, I have the button to work as autofocus also, but I'll be honest, I rarely use it. With our muscle memory, where you're so used to using your button or you're used to using your autofocus button on the, on the side of your camera or on the back of your camera, I'm not really too, I'm an old dog. I'm not trying to learn new tricks, but you know, if you want to do it, it's, it's there. You can use it also for white balance. I think that's what I set up one of the other buttons for. Um, so it's just a nice additional thing to have on there. Now, as far as autofocus speed, I do notice it's, it's very quick. I do walking shots all the time. Uh, in some of the photos that you're seeing, we had the couple walking towards us or we had the family walking towards us. And I would focus on probably like the bigger person where it can track them. And as they're walking towards us in AFC, camera and the lens continuously keep refocusing on them. So as they're getting closer, we're not losing them. They're not getting out of focus. So we always, 99% of the time, I say I would use AFC flexible spot uh, to make sure that whatever I want to be in focus stays in focus or keeps refocusing as they're moving. Now, one thing that really surprised me is the bokeh on this camera, the back blur because the 35 to 150 it's pretty it's nice but there's something about this that has it almost feels like a shallower depth of field but it's it's just the and i'm and trust me i'm not one of those people that overanalyze like blur and pay attention i'm not like that i, I look at these things as tools that help me get the job done and of course it has to be pleasing, but I'm not gonna sit there under a microscope and stare at it. However, for it to jump at me like that, even when I'm not looking for it, it means that it definitely has a different type of feel over let's say a 35 to 150. This lens, there's something softer about how it, it captures the background. There's something about the twinkling lights in the back that look a little bit different, that just look nicer. So that's the best way that I can put it. And I'm trying to remember, I don't think on the version one, I felt that kind of blur that caught my attention. So definitely something that that stood out about this is that bokeh. It's a very pleasing type of blur that it creates. Another feature that I really like is the throw from 70 to 180. It's just very, very short. I know it sounds like a silly feature, but when you're shooting something and something's happening over there really quick and just being able to quickly zoom into 180, or zoom out if they're walking really fast or whatever. If some action's happening, you go, oh, and you wanna make sure you get the whole thing. Shorter throw definitely helps out in situations like that, so you don't miss the shot. Instead of turning it an entire rotation, it's just a quarter throw, and it's just from 70 to 180, you have that really, really quick access to different focal lengths. So I, I know it sounds really minute, but you kinda have to play with it yourself to see what I'm talking about. It's just, I really like that, that aspect of it. And it's something that I wasn't thinking when I was reviewing it or thinking about it when I was shooting, but the more I shot with it, the more I'm like, like, I like that. Like, I like that it's such a short distance to get to where you wanna be. And as far as any chromatic aberration or uh, anything like that, I mean, at this point in 2023, 
if you're buying a lens that's even semi-professional, you don't really have to worry about it too much. Uh, so the, I didn't notice any chromatic aberration on my end. As far as distortion, I'm not, I'm, admittedly, I'm not the most eagle eye when it comes to that, but I didn't notice any distortion that, that threw me off. Like if there was something that jumped at me, I would be mentioning it to you guys, but I didn't notice any significant or any distortion at all. In low light, it, it did a tremendous job. I was shooting, uh, as you guys are seeing right now, I was shooting my friend's Lamborghini at night to test out to see. There were several things that I was testing out that night with this lens and the Lamborghini. One of the things was how it does in low light. And as you're seeing, it really, really did well. I didn't really have too many issues with it back focusing or I don't even remember it back focusing at all. I've shot weddings with it in low light situations. Didn't have any issues with that either. It kept up really nicely. Nothing that made me think this is slowing me down in my process. And on top of that, going back to when I shot my friend's Lamborghini that night, we shot one thing that I wanted to test out for you guys is the vibration compensation. How good is it? And on the photo that you're seeing right now, I was shooting it at 1 30th of a second and I was either at 180 or close to 180 and the image was sharp which is insane to be at that focal length and for the photo to be sharp. Granted, I was shooting it on an A9 and it does have in-body stabilization also, which a lot of the cameras that you guys are using, I'm sure do as well. So that helps paired with the vibration compensation on the lens. 1 30th of a second at 180, I was pretty surprised with how good it was. However, keep this in mind, if you're shooting at that focal length and you're shooting at a slow shutter, it has to be something that isn't moving so obviously if someone's moving you're not going to get it sharp at 1 30th of a second because they're going to move but something that's standing still or a detail or something like that as long as you tuck those elbows in and then just hold it really really close to your body and one thing that i also do actually is i hold my breath when i shoot this is something that i learned a long time ago so hold your breath because even this little bit of breathing when you're doing this it shakes the camera a little bit so i tuck in hold my breath and then i shoot and then and i also shoot I'll shoot multiple frames. So I'll shoot like three of them because one of them it might be a little shaky and then the other one's correct. So, you know, there's there's a little bit of technique to it, but you can get sharp images at very low shutter speeds at a long focal length, which is tremendous. A another feature that compares this one to the version one is focusing distance. Now this, I did write down the exact amount of distance because it's relevant. So focusing distance on the version one was 33.5 inches because america we do inches i don't know uh if you guys want to translate it in the comments <laughs> what that is and then in um on the g2 it's 11.8 inches so one third of the focusing distance this is really something that i've always liked about this lens from the version one to the version two it's been something that really is appealing the fact that you get the 70 to 180 focal length and you have that nice portrait type of lens but then you can use it like a macro lens essentially at 70 mil. So at 70 millimeters, you're seeing a couple of shots here that I shot in macro mode essentially. And I mean, it's, I'm gonna touch on that on the end as far as my final thoughts, but that right there is a beautiful feature that they included because it makes this lens even more versatile. Honestly, it's a tremendous lens. From the version one, it's been great. I was very surprised that they had updated to a version two already or a G2 already because of how good that first one was. However, I do think that it was the feedback from you guys, from YouTube comments, from uh, people leaving comments on social media that they created one. I think vibration compensation was probably the biggest thing because I do remember when I posted the first video, I got a few comments asking, hey, does it have vibration compensation? And it didn't. It was never an issue for me because of the in-body stabilization, however, it was enough of an issue for Tamron to say, okay, let's go make one that the people are asking for with this included. So is it a leap from the first one? It's got enough to say that it, that it is, like vibration compensation, like focusing distance, like the fact that you can update the firmware. So there's a, a ton of different things that would make it a very different lens than the first one. However, when you break it down, the meat and potatoes, it's still a wonderful lens, just like the first version was. If you have the first version, would I recommend you selling it and getting the version two? Depends. Are you in a situation where vibration compensation would have changed how you shot? If you shoot a decent amount of video, that probably is a really big plus from this lens. 
if you shoot just photo now nah, maybe i would wait a little bit i don't think it's something that you need to go out and, and rush and buy however if you sell it on the used market the version one and then spend a few hundred dollars more and get the the g2 it's not such a bad trade-off since you're not buying it brand new speaking of which brand new is 12.99 on the tamron website on bnh and the other store uh sometimes I have seen Tamron will do a sale where it's like $100 off or $150 off, depending on which lens. So, you know, keep an eye on it if you wanted to either switch or actually buy or, or buy it for the first time. For me, I feel like the 35 to 150 is still my main, my main squeeze. That thing is incredible. It does everything that I need it to do. It gives me the versatility on wedding days, on events to make sure that I can get whatever I need. This, I'll be honest. I shot an entire family session that you're seeing right now with this lens because we were outdoors. We wanted that depth of field. So it, it was perfect for that situation. The 35 to 150 is a little bit more versatile for, let's say, a wedding day where you might be in a church or you might be in a tighter room where the 70 is still not wide enough. However, if you're more of an eagle eye type of shooter that the bokeh, the blur makes more of a difference to you where you're willing to carry two or three lenses just because you get that slightly better blur, then yes, then this would be worth it. Uh, for me, I love that I have that plus, plus the macro aspect of it. Because to me, I go, if I were to go out and buy a macro lens, I'm spending 600 to 1000, something like that. And if I'm spending just a little bit more, I get a secondary long lens. So it, God forbid something happens to my, my zoom lens, I have a second lens. And I can also use it for macro when I need to do those close up detail shots of the rings or anything like that. So it's a nice extra tool to have. And to be honest, if I'm shooting a family session, nine times out of 10, I'm going to take this one just because it's lighter, it's easier to carry, and it's everything really that you need for family sessions. Uh, it does great on headshots and, and on a wedding day, if you're shooting through like string lights and stuff like that, you get that depth of field that's just a little bit nicer than let's say a 35 to 150 because you can go to 180 at 2.8. So it's a great lens. Honestly, if anybody were to ask me, should I get a 70 to 200 in 2023? I couldn't recommend a 70 to 200, 2.8 or F4, either way. This is so much lighter. This is so sharp. And then the fact that it's also carrying the macro capabilities in it, you're getting extra where the 70 to 200, you're not getting that macro. You would need to carry an extra lens with that. And as of this moment, the 70 to 200 is more expensive than this. So those are my final thoughts. I hope I didn't go on too many tangents, guys. Um, if you have any comments, any questions, please leave them down below. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Uh, Tamron, thank you for sending the lens to have us test out. Thank you for not telling me what to say or giving me any guidelines. They give us a lens and they say, have at it give people your honest opinion. So hopefully you guys got something out of this. Thank you guys so much for watching.